Welcome to a video called the Deep Dive Video. And I always feel I need to explain this because I mean deep dive in a bit of a different context. I do a video each day. I do a weekly video. I do an intermarket analysis video. I also do a what to watch video. This video is where I go through all of the charts, mainly the daily charts, and I pick out those charts that I really didn't talk about all that much over the past week. There are also some charts that are unique just to this video, and I put them all together because sometimes we can get some insight as to what's happening by looking at this video. This is being prepared for Monday, April 15th. This first chart was really useful for a while. It measures high beta stocks, and these are stocks that tend to outperform the market. Unfortunately, they not only outperform to the upside, they outperform to the downside too. <clears throat> When we see this really going up, that means the high beta stocks are really outperforming, and we call that risk on. When it's going down, that means that folks are getting out of the high beta stocks, and they're getting into more conservative stocks that may still be going down, but probably going down less, and that's what we call risk off. Sometimes we get some really nice swings in this chart, but really, since the beginning of 2024, we've been chopping around in a range, so I haven't been showing this chart. This is a chart of the VIX, and it measures the speed of the VIX. Now, I did show this a few days ago, but I haven't recently, so I wanted to show it again here. The VIX measures fear. The higher the fear gauge is, the higher the fear in the market, and that usually means we're going down at that point. Well, when the VIX gets really low, that means there's not much fear in the market, and we're really complacent. On the bottom, we have an RSI, which is a momentum oscillator based on nine periods. And this measures how fast is the VIX actually moving. Last week, when we had a pretty significant down day, this really gave us a high reading. Well, since that time, it's come off. And even though the VIX is continuing to go up as stocks have been under pressure, this momentum oscillator has actually been coming down. So I haven't been showing this in the video. Also, I look at the VIX, and then I look at a thing called the VVIX, which measures the volatility of the VIX. It's like the VIX of the VIX. And then we do a ratio between them. And in a general sense, what I follow is down on the bottom. When this is going down, that tends to be positive for stocks. When this is going up, that's negative for stocks. Right now, we're continuing to go up and pretty much have been, even though stocks have been strong since the beginning of the year, we're still seeing this ratio continuing to go up. Then this is also a VIX, but you don't see the VIX on here. When the VIX was developed, it was developed with static numbers in mind. When we have 12 or below, that means there's no fear in the market. When we're at 20 or above, that means there's a lot of fear in the market. Well, as the environment changes, the VIX can go into a different range and it doesn't stick to those static numbers. For instance, back in the great financial crisis, when stocks were really going down, the VIX went up to a much higher range. Then as we were coming out of that, the VIX, the VIX then ended up going into a lower range. Then after the COVID plunge, we went into a higher range. And now we've been working our way into a lower range again. This is nothing that we use to make decisions. It's really just informational. Also, I do a study where I look at the correlation between the VIX and the S&P 500. On top is a five-period moving average of the VIX. And that's, that's a whole different study. What I focus on on this chart is the correlation. Sometimes when we get a really high reading and we're not necessarily seeing that confirmed with other fear gauges that we look at, that means that the market may be getting really nervous. Well, right now we're getting a neutral reading from this particular chart, so I haven't been showing it. Here's another fear gauge, which typically we've been going down overall when we measure this type of fear in the market, lately it's been poking its head back up, but we've been seeing some other fear gauges that we use actually give us enough information, so I haven't been including this chart either. Then we have the move index on top, which measures the volatility of bonds, and that's really been picking up as bond prices have gone down with interest rates going up. The VIX has really picked up as well as stocks have been going down. What I mainly focus on here is the correlation on the bottom. And they had a really strong tendency. Now, this is not measuring price. This is just measuring the move index with the VIX. 
they were going in the same direction at the same time. Now we're we're seeing that they're still doing that, but not as strong as they had been. Then we have a thing called the skew index, which is kind of like the VIX. The VIX uses at the money options to do its calculations. The skew index looks at out of the money options. And when we get up into this red area, that means that the market is expecting some kind of a big move. We're not really sure what that move is going to be. Sometimes that marks a top, sometimes a bottom, sometimes just a continuation. We were getting some readings a few weeks back, but since that time, we've dropped down into the more of the neutral area. So I haven't been including this chart. Then we look at a ratio between the VIX and the move index. And it's kind of strange because even though stocks have been going up, we're seeing this ratio continuing to go up as well, just showing that the overall trend has been higher. When stocks are really going up, this ratio has a tendency to come down. So we're, we're kind of seeing a little contradiction there. Then we look at another fear gauge, which hasn't been helpful in 2024 because it's been chopping more or less sideways. Sometimes this can really move up. Sometimes it can really move down. And then we have the same chart again here. Then we look at how far are we from the all-time high that was set in early January 2022. We've fallen back a little bit, but we're still 6.33% above the previous all-time high. Then we have a thing called technical alerts. These are put out by stockcharts.com. I show these in every daily video, but this is looking at all of the alerts that were triggered for the week. When it's an up day, it tends to be more positive. When it's a down day, like we saw on Friday, it tends to be more negative. And this can kind of give us a little bit of a clue, just looking at the color of, is it more negative? Is it more positive? So I follow these things as they're happening, but then I break them down on a daily basis. And some of these apply to the S&P, some to the NASDAQ, some to different sectors. Then there are really five main indexes that I fo focus on. Everything that I do is centered around the S&P 500. But then I also look at other indexes like the Dow. We look at the NASDAQ 100, the mid caps and the small caps. And stockcharts.com has this ability to rate them using technical analysis, giving them a score from zero to 100. The higher the score, the better looking the chart. You're trying to remove as much emotion as possible from analyzing these charts. Coming in first place, which had been in first place for a long time and then dropped back, and it's even falling back a little bit too, are the QQQs, which is the ETF for the NASDAQ 100, coming in at 85.8. In second place is the S&P 500, represented by the SPY. That's the ETF for the S&P 500, coming in at 80.9. In third place are the mid caps, which also fell back a little bit, but they're coming in at 74.5. We have the small caps coming in at 58.4, and they've been a real disappointment so far in 2024. But in last place is the Dow, and it had been holding up better. It's seeing some weakness now coming in at 48.1, as we're seeing some of the real blue chip stocks be under pressure lately. And we have some short-term charts. This is a short-term rainbow, and all these colored lines here are moving averages ranging from 10 periods up to 50 periods. All the lines are still going up, but you can see that we're coming back down into the rainbow and we're starting to test this upward short-term trend that we've been in. And we're going to see, are we going to be able to bounce off of that and go back up into the rainbow or are we going to fall down below the rainbow? Then this is a study called the boom indicator. And I base this around three different moving averages, a 20 period, a 50 period, and a 200 period. I developed this indicator decades ago, but it was when I was attending an online webinar when somebody was trying to show this concept that I, sh I show in this indicator here. And they call it, they just kept saying, boom, boom, boom. And so I just came up with the boom indicator for that. What this does is it measures how far price is getting either above or below a particular moving average. Because when it gets really far away, boom, it has a tendency to snap back more to the moving average. And that's what this measures. We were getting some extreme readings when the market was going up. We were getting far away from the 20 period. We were actually getting far away from the 50 period. We had been positive and with the distance we were going up, but not getting extreme when we measure it how far away it is from the 200-day moving average. 
But since the market has been under pressure, all of these measurements have been declining. And we have an intermediate term rainbow. This goes from 50 periods up to 100 periods. We're still above all the lines. Even though the market's been pulling back, the intermediate term trend, at least according to this moving average study, still shows that we're positive. Then we have moving averages, which they take the current price and then measure backwards. And if you have a 20 period moving average, it takes the average over those 20 periods and gives you what the average price should be. And there's different kinds of moving averages. There's exponential and simple. Well, there's another kind of moving average that's become quite popular and useful that tends to look forward. It's called an anchored moving average where we can go to a previous high, previous low, what have you, and then it shoots that moving average forward. The one that I have here is anchored back to the previous all-time high. And we had come down and really tested this last October. That's about where we bottomed and then started to come up out of that. We're still far away from this. If it looks like we're putting in some kind of top here, I may go back and add some more anchored moving averages to this chart, but I just haven't seen the need yet. Not enough has really developed. Then we have a Connors RSI, which is pretty much like a regular RSI, a momentum indicator, which also helps us decide or see if we're getting extreme positive or negative. We're not seeing that right now, so I haven't been showing this chart. Then we're dealing with the 20 period moving averages right now. We're dropping below them. So the short term trend is in danger at the current time. We're currently testing the 50 period moving averages right now. The next level down that I measure anyway would be the 100 period moving averages. And since we're still far away from that, I haven't been showing this chart. And we wanna measure how far away are we above or below the 200 day simple moving average. We have dropped back, but we're still it's hard to read that, but 9.96% above the 200-day simple moving average. Then we have a composite CMB composite index. This is supposed to be a standalone trading system. I use this like an oscillator. When it goes above the black line or below the lower black line, that's an extreme reading. Otherwise, I usually don't use this indicator all that much. And we measure standard deviation. This doesn't measure direction. This measures speed over the last 10 periods. As we've been going down kind of fast here, we're seeing a little bit of pickup here with the standard deviation, but we're still well below the moving average. If we break above the moving average, then I'll start to show this chart more. And then we want to keep an eye on the S&P 100, which are the biggest stocks in the S&P 500. They're actually holding up a little bit better. If you look at Friday's bar, we were down, but you can see where the S&P 500 was down more. This is just telling us in a very short-term way that the bigger stocks are outperforming the smaller stocks. And these are some measurements going from the low that we set we, back in October. We actually, we hit the high back in July of 2023. Then we came down. And even with the retracement that we've seen, we're still up over 20% going back to the low set in October. Then this is a really good indicator sometimes when we're in more of a bear market and it looks like we could be bottoming and due for some kind of a bounce out of that. And since we've really been going up and we're still positive, even though we're testing things right now, the Pring bottom fissure really, first of all, it's going down. It generates a signal when these lines cross. And so this is not really helping us. The mass index, it only generates a signal when these lines get up around the red dash line and the blue line. Long term, this is another rainbow chart where we go from 50 periods up to 250 periods and we're still well above all the lines here even though we're threatening to come down. Right now we're sitting at about the 50 period moving average. This is a chart called the special K. It's a long term oscillator and we don't get many signals from this so I don't show this chart in the regular videos unless we actually see a signal being generated and this is positive on the daily chart. We're above the moving average, where the weekly chart still continues to be negative. Then we took a look at the weekly S&P 500 on top and the German DAX weekly chart in the middle area. We just want to see, are they correlating with each other right now? Because sometimes Europe and the US, they tend to go hand in hand. And Germany has the biggest stock market in the EU. So that's the one that I typically focus on. They had a stronger relationship. It's coming down a little bit, but it's still showing that they're having a tendency to go in the same direction at the same time. 
It doesn't tell us the direction. It just means, are they moving in the same direction, either up or down? Then we look at the 10-year yield on top and subtract the German yield. That gives us a positive answer since U.S. rates are higher. And sometimes we can get some insight as to what might be happening with the U.S. dollar index. We plot that in the middle. But right now, even though the correlation is picking up, it's still pretty neutral. Then this is a thing called the Hindenburg Omen. And we really only wait until this gets generated to talk about it. And the perma bears just love this indicator and they love to bring it up and they even say, we're close, we're close, even when there's not a signal being generated. Stock charts has an indicator that takes the three different criteria for a Hindenburg omen and puts them together. And we did have one generated right at the first part of, eight, of February in 2024. But for this to be a legitimate signal, it has to be confirmed seeing two spikes up within 20 trading days. Well, now we went through the end of February, all of March, and we're into April, and we haven't seen another spike yet. Then we look at some different support and resistance. This is an Ichimoku cloud, which really are just moving averages that are shifted forward that sometimes act as support when we're going up and fall back. Sometimes they act as resistance when we're going down and see a bounce. Then a broad market measure. This is the Vixen. Gotta love that name. The VIX is the volatility of the S&P 500. The Vixen is the volatility for the NASDAQ 100. And as the NASDAQ 100 has been under a little bit of pressure, we have been seeing this rising a bit. Keeping an eye on the bank ETF, the banks, some of the big banks reported earnings on Friday, and it was not very well received. So we're seeing some weakness here in the bank ETF. But longer term, it's still in an uptrend even though pretty much since the earlier part of December, this has been chopping sideways. We also want to keep an eye on the regional banking ETF, and then we compare it with the financial sector. And this is just showing that the regional banks are underperforming. This is a measure of, if this is going up, the market is anticipating a soft landing, meaning that, okay, we see some economic weakness here, but we're not necessarily going to go into a recession. A hard landing means, yeah, we're in a recession. And this is what the market has pretty much been counting on. And it's still thinking that way as long as this is going up, even though it's pulled back lately. Just to keep an eye on home construction compared with three to seven year bonds. Now we are coming back down now. Stocks have been under pressure. Interest rates have been going back up. But overall, this is continuing to go up because this is a very interest rate sensitive part of the market. And if we really see this start to dive, that's when we get more nervous and think that it could be more inflationary. If this can turn and go back up, that would show some improvement and it would help alleviate some inflationary fears. And we look at a ratio of the QQQs to the diamonds. And then I look at the correlation down on the bottom between that ratio in the middle and the S&P on top. And they're actually having a tendency to go in opposite directions as the market is kind of trying to figure out what it wants to do these days. Then we look at the QQQs and then compare that with the three to seven year bonds where this is still looking good. This is meaning that the QQQs, the NASDAQ 100 are outperforming three to seven year bonds based on price. We also compare the three to seven year bond with the Eurozone where this is falling back a little bit. So we wanna keep an eye on this, but it's still maintaining more of an uptrend. Then we look at a ratio between staples, the things you have to have in tech, the thing that is making lives so much easier, supposedly, and just do a ratio. And it's just showing that the staples, even though staples are up, if you look at staples by themselves, they're in an uptrend. But when you compare them with tech, they are really underperforming. And we look at the transports. This has really been underperforming as well. We do a ratio between the transports and the S&P 500. This continues to go down. This has been a little bit of a concern in the market because the transports need to do better, and they're not even close to getting back to their all-time high, where the Dow has set a recent all-time high that has not been confirmed by a new all-time high in the transports. And this is the financial sector. Sometimes I don't even show this chart, even in this video. We're coming down a little bit here, but this is a really solid support level. If we continue to really, really, really go down, then I'll be focusing on this chart more. Some rate of change charts, these are just for information. 
This is 250 periods. So it takes Friday's close and goes back 250 trading days. We are going up, but we have been pulling back lately. This is another look at that same chart. We did get up to this blue line here. Nothing magical about that. I put the blue line on here. But when we get to this level, sometimes that means we might be getting a little extreme and we have been pulling back since that time. Keeping an eye on bonds. This looks at one to three year bonds, shorter term bonds, and compares them with three to seven year bonds a little further out. When this is going up, that means the one to three year bonds are outperforming. That means folks are nervous about interest rates. As interest rates are going up, people want to get into shorter term maturity so they can roll them over, thinking that interest rates are going to be higher when they do the rollover. When this is going down, now they're locking in three to seven year bonds, thinking, okay, interest rates may have topped out and they're going to come down. So I want to lock that rate in for as long as possible. Well, we're starting to go back up here meaning that there are some inflationary fears coupled with the rise in interest rates. Here's an inverse of that, but we're looking at seven to 10 year bonds versus three to seven year bonds. When this is going down, that means folks are preferring the three to seven year bonds over the seven to 10 year bonds. And this is also suggesting kind of in an inverse way that inflation right now appears to be a concern. Then we look at the long-term bond ETF. That's in blue and the S&P. That's in red. And we look at the long-term correlation or relationship between the two. It's not as strong. It's improving a little bit here where the short-term relationship based on 10 periods, it's a little bit stronger, but has been dropping off lately. And we look at the QQQs and compare it with the TLT, the long-term bond ETF. And their relationship right now is pretty much neutral. They're just friends right now. And then we keep an eye on the yield curve, the 10 to the two and the 10 to the three month, they are still inverted. I do have some other yield curves on here, but the market really focuses on these top two here. If we ever go back to being normal again, which yeah, someday that's going to happen. We just thought it would have happened probably by now. That generally starts the countdown to see if we're going to go into a recession or not. And the average is about five months to see if that's going to happen. Then this are. This next chart shows the thing called TIPS, which are Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. These are shorter term and they also adjust for interest rates. So when interest rates are going up, people want to get into these. And that means that they're worried about inflation and they want these shorter term TIPS. Now, when we may have topped out with interest rates and are starting to come down, they're not getting into TIPS anymore. They're getting into three to seven year bonds. But we've been going sideways lately here. This is where it's a little bit more concerning. We also compare tips with seven to 10 year bonds where the tips were really outperforming with interest rate fears. It's starting to go back up again. It had really been declining, but now in 2024, we're wondering if this is a problem as we've been getting more than a lot of stronger than expected economic reports. Then we look at one to three months, a T bill, which you could pretty much call cash. And we compare that with three to seven year bonds based on price. When this is going up, that just means that there's a lot of uncertainty about interest rates. It had been coming down. Now it's starting to go back up. We're actually seeing a golden cross here with this ratio as there's some inflationary fears in the market right now. Then I have a thing called possible positive scenarios. I really broke these out back in 2022 when we were more in a a cyclical bear market at that time. And when we would really get screaming to the downside and it looked like possibly we were bottoming and could bounce back up out of that, that's when I use most of these charts. But these charts can still be helpful no matter what kind of an environment that we're in. However, I'm not showing all of them in the daily videos, the other ones I'm showing right here. This is a study of the stocks on a percentage basis that are above their 200-day simple moving average that are inside the S&P 500. Now, I have another study that I follow that's very close to this, but I use this in a little different way. I use this like an oscillator. When we get an extreme positive or negative reading, haven't done that. We are declining right now as the market's been declining, but we're still above 50. So longer term, this is still looking more positive. Then we do that same type of thing and we look at the stocks above their 50-day moving average. Also use it like an oscillator, which we did get an extreme reading right at the end of 2023. But since then, we've been falling down. And this is showing some weakness in the market right now that could be a concern. 
Then we spread that out. We look at the mid caps, which are also showing some weakness right now, and the small caps, which are showing even more weakness right now. Then this chart just looks at the two-year treasury yield. Sometimes when the two-year treasury yield spikes up and then starts to come down, that means inter short-term interest rates are coming down quickly. That often can give short to intermediate term support to the S&P 500. We're still going up and it hasn't been as, as pronounced as other times when we've seen this spike. Then this looks at the Staples to S&P 500 ratio. I actually have been showing this in the recent videos. When this is going down, that often gives support. That means that the staple sector is underperforming the S&P 500. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. After this, I will be preparing what I call the what to watch video. I hope you're having a great weekend and I will talk to you in the next video.